So next to the stage is David, who we all know. I'm getting to know him a lot better this week, but David is the founder and CEO of CMX, the premier membership for community professionals. CMX's mission is to help community professionals thrive. The CMX team has trained hundreds of companies in community strategy, including teams at Facebook, Google, and Salesforce. Today, thousands of community professionals come to CMX every day to learn, connect, and grow. Without further ado, I give you the awesome David. Hey everybody, long time no see. Everyone awake? How many breweries you go to last night? Be honest. I did get some sleep last night. Not enough, never enough, but I did sleep like a rock. Yesterday took a lot of energy. But we have another action-packed day today, and I'm very excited to kick us off uh, with uh, the, a similar talk that I, I've given in previous years where I want to kind of touch on some of the higher-level trends that are happening in the industry. Um, and all these aren't necessarily specific to community professionals, but I think uh, there are larger trends happening on the internet, uh, in our society that are impacting our work in different ways. So let's dive right in. Trend number one, privacy is becoming a huge, huge priority for, for everyone, for people on the internet. Um, it's becoming something that they look for and they expect in the platforms that they're using. So a recent study from Global Web Index showed that 25% of people strongly agreed that they were worried the internet is eroding their per personal privacy, which is up from 18% in 2013. 43%, this was a study in, in Canada, so 43% of Canadian adults have now taken a significant online action to protect their data and their privacy, like uh, installing browser extensions to block web, web trackers. So people are starting to, this is gonna be a big concern for them, and, and they're starting to take more and more actions to try to protect their privacy and their data online. And I think this trend has been happening for a while, right? Like uh, it was 10 years ago or so that social media really started to blow up and it's been growing and it's been growing and growing. And we're starting to learn what the impact is of that. And we start to see this trend a little bit last year and, and I actually shared that I thought 2018, this was in December 2017, 2018 is gonna see a major backlash towards addictive devices and social technology. And that started happening this year. So the delete Facebook thing happened and it was a, a hashtag that spread a lot, but uh, looking at the data recently, uh, Recode recently published that there are a lot of people now who are intentionally removing themselves from these platforms. So uh, uh, more than a quarter of the US, of US Facebook users deleted the app from their phones in the last year, and 44% of 18 to 29 year olds said that they deleted their Facebook app in the last year. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of people start to try to check their addiction to their phones, and they're starting to lose trust, right? A lot of this came from how uh, Facebook handled data and a lot of the, the Cambridge Analytica and issues that happened there. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger priority, and it's becoming a bigger priority for businesses as well. <laughs> so a lot of us probably have to deal with GDPR this year. Uh, it's uh, the new laws that happened in the EU, and even though it was just focused on, on, on consumers in the EU, uh, most or a lot of U.S. companies have cu customers in the EU, and so everyone had to kind of rethink, how do we handle data? How do we handle privacy? How do we handle uh, data ownership of our customers? And it's become a really big priority, and the expectation is that that's going to continue in the U.S. to have those kinds of standards where the consumer has control over their data and control over their privacy. And this was a big challenge for community professionals as... A lot of the work we do is to track this data, is to collect these insights about our members, is to have a deeper understanding of who our community members are and how they're participating so that we can serve them better and so that we can bring them more value. But we have to rethink how do we organize our member databases, how do we 
how do we access this data and how do we give our community members access to that data? And this is now an expectation that every single community platform, all the technology you're using, needs to be GDPR compliant if you have any consumers in the EU. So privacy and data uh, became a really, really big priority. And what we're also seeing is now people are starting to turn to smaller groups and messaging apps for our number two trend. People are getting a little bit fatigued by the really large social networks, the really long news feeds, and they're starting to look for more intimate experiences and, and, and closed groups. So Facebook Groups now has 1.4 billion monthly active users. That's one-fifth of the human population on this planet are active on Facebook Groups alone. Right, so we've seen Facebook, we heard from Lindsay yesterday making a huge focus on groups and we're seeing it grow exponentially, right? Messaging apps have now surpassed social apps. People are using apps like WhatsApp and Messenger much more than Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Not much more, but you can see it's, it's increasing and it's now actually surpassed it. So the way people are using the internet is shifting to these more personal and more, and more closed groups. And we're seeing these chat-based community platforms start to grow a lot as well. So Telegram has now hit 200 million monthly actives, and Discord, another platform similar to Slack, uh, but public-facing and got really big in the gaming community, uh, has uh, tripled in size in the last year, going from 45 million to 135 million today. And so these are the more chat-based, closed groups, more intimate platforms that people are starting to turn to more and more online. And a lot of it has to do with how people are accessing their communities online. And it's becoming more and more mobile focused. So this is a report that Buffer published. 94% of Facebook's monthly users are accessing it through their phone. 82% on Twitter and 60% on LinkedIn. So the way people are using community online, the way they want to interact online is becoming more and more mobile. Uh, we're accessing it through our mobile phone. So as you're thinking about what platform should you use and how are you bringing people together in your communities, uh, being mobile accessible and being optimized for mobile is becoming more important. And if you think about it, it's changing the way we interact, right? Because you can't type as long messages and as thoughtful things in, in a mobile community. You usually don't, right? It's a shorter message. It might be a GIF or an image that's much easier to share. And so how we see engagement and what is meaningful engagement is going to continue to change as people use their phones to access our communities more and more. And internal communities is also going to this chat-based function. We now see that Slack's valued at uh, over $5 billion. They have over 3 million paying users now. So this is an internal platform. It's, uh, most, it's targeted for employees to communicate with each other, and it's taking that world by storm. So internal communication tools is all going into this more chat-based program as well, with over 8 million active, daily active users. Brings us to trend number three. We became really, really good at growing these platforms. We became really, really good at growing these companies to billions and billions of dollars. But I think we're starting to see, especially this year, 2018 was a critical year for starting to see how Growth at all costs actually has a whole lot of costs. And so in the funding space, we're seeing this new trend of companies that are trying to forego the traditional VC model. So this is a, an article that was published by Recode reviewing all these consumer brands like Movement and Tough and Needle who decided not to take VC funding. They're either, uh, they either took boot, boot, they just bootstrapped it or they took a, a minimal amount of funding and, and they were able to control their organizations. They were able to grow more thoughtfully. Right? I think this is, this is such an important trend because I think when companies are driven by VC money, which means they go from, series, from, a, from a C to Series A to Series B, it's constantly about growth. It's constantly about more. It becomes hard to slow down. It becomes hard to be intentional about how you're engaging with your customers and the kind of culture you're trying to build. And so as companies are starting to push back on that model, it's allowing them to be a lot more thoughtful. It's allowing them to build the kind of companies and products that they want. 
Now we saw a couple pretty well-known, fast-growing companies that were on the VC treadmill try to stop it and turn back. So this year, both Buffer and Wistia decided we're going to buy out our investors. Instead of raising that next round, let's figure out how we can buy out the VC investors that are driving that, uh, that expectation and that growth because they want it to slow down. Right? If, you're, if you're a VC-backed company, you have to get to uh, you know billion-dollar valuation in five to ten years for that VC to be successful. They need at least one of their companies to be able to do that in most of their funds. And, and so that's the expectation. But by buying out those investors, both Wissy and Buffer said, we want to be around for the long run. We want to invest in our customers in the long run. We want to be more thoughtful about how we build our, our company. And, and they're two of the most community-focused businesses out there. And, and it makes sense, because if you actually look at the data, only 1% of the companies that take VC funding actually reach that billion-dollar valuation. Most companies that take VC funding do not meet the expectations of VCs. And I've been in San Francisco now seven years, and it's still just the default. You start a company, you start a business, you raise VC funding. You raise your first round, and you get on that cycle. And we're starting to see that pushback, right? And we're starting to see new models come out for funding as well, which has been really interesting. Uh, you can see the burning unicorn head here, courtesy of our friends at IndyVC. Um, IndyVC is one of the examples where they said, this, this model doesn't work. They actually came from the traditional VC space and they said, there are thousands of companies that could be really impactful, really meaningful companies, but just don't fit that model. And they need funding mechanisms to help those companies grow. And they could be $10 million businesses, $100 million businesses, without reaching that extreme point. And they could be sustainable and they could be really impactful. So we're starting to see more funds like NDVC, like Tugboat, uh, there's revenue-based funds that invest in companies ba on, based on profit, based on revenue. At, they grow together. And I think uh, we're going to continue to see a lot more of these options come because that growth at all costs model just isn't serving us anymore. And so we're starting to see this pushback against growth, against more funding, against mo just more people, more activity. We see programs like the Center for Humane Technology, that are trying to realign our technology, realign our social platforms with, with humanity, with, with what we actually need as people, with meaningful connection and meaningful community. You know, the, the time well spent movement is, has started, it's begun. And we're, all, we're also seeing publications launch. This publication just launched with funding from Craig Newmark of Craigslist, and their entire focus is just to check in on the, the ethics and the impact that technology is having on humanity. So you see this narrative growing. This is a little bit of a distrust right now for our big companies, for our billion, multi-billion dollar companies, for our big platforms. And it makes sense because it's a serious problem we have right now. This study from Pew Research showed that 41% of Americans have experienced online harassment, and 18% of those people have experienced severe online harassment, which inc includes sexual harassment, uh, stalking, continued harassment, 18% of Americans have experienced severe online harassment. And they expect these platforms to be able to help us with that, right? They're, they're looking to the platforms that are hosting us to, to police it, to improve it. 79% uh, expected the online services to step in when these bad behaviors occur. They expect uh, us, the businesses, the ones bringing them together to step in and make sure harassment isn't happening. But on these really large platforms that have billions of people using them, it's extremely hard to control that culture, right? That's why when we talk about community and starting small, because that's where you get to craft the culture. Now they're so big, it's, it's an insane technical challenge to, to solve uh, harassment, fake news, um, all the negative things that we're seeing on the platforms. But they are working on it. And, you know, we, we had a we've had a chance to work with Facebook a whole lot uh, over the last couple of years on, on their Facebook groups program, and that's going really well. And, you know, they, they're trying to fight these other problems, too. So this was a, a study done of, of news sites. So it's looking at millions and millions of views on news sites on both platforms. And you can see here the, the image on the left, Facebook, right, is Twitter. This is specifically focused on fake news. And you can see fake news was uh, on the rise, right? The, the top two and the bottom left graph 
is uh, business news, main news sites, small news sites, and the bottom right is fake news. And you can see that point where it peaks was back in uh, about 2016, 2017, right when uh, it really became an issue and became a forefront. That's when Facebook started pri prioritizing fighting fake news. And you can see it dipped straight down. And they actually have had a pretty considerable uh, uh, impact on fighting fake news on the platform. Twitter, not so much. Twitter, you can see it's just continuing to go up. Twitter is not been able to solve their fake news problem. They've not been able to solve their harassment problem. And this is a, it's a space where a lot of people are going to find community and connection today. And so it's a, it is a serious problem. And so, so this, this whole movement, this whole time well spent, the, the quality of our time online has led into what, what I think is driving a lot of enthusiasm for our fourth trend, of the growth of blockchain and the decentralized web and how it's captured the imagination of the tech world. And look, I have a lot of my own skepticism and doubts about a lot of things in, in crypto and in blockchain, but the truth is this is a very real movement that has a whole lot of money going into it. So almost $1 billion was invested into blockchain in 2017, and 2018, this graph was updated in February of 2018, and it was almost already half a billion just in February. So we're on a path to way surpass the amount invested into blockchain in 2018. There are now over 25 million people who have actually installed and used blockchain wallets. So we're seeing more and more people start to use it and start to try to figure it out. The expectation from a study by Statistica is that the blockchain market is going to go grow to $2.3 trillion uh, annually by 2021. So it's a huge market. And it's not just entrepreneurs, it's not just startups and technologists. Uh, the big companies are investing in it as well. Both Alibaba and IBM each hold close to 100 patents. IBM has 1,500 employees focused just on blockchain. So we're seeing some of the big companies, the tech leaders in our industry, invest really, really heavily into blockchain technology. So whether or not it, it, it ultimately works, whether or not you believe in the technology, the truth is there's a whole lot of money and a whole lot of really smart people, a whole lot of big businesses investing in it. Now why does this matter for all of you? Why does it matter for community builders? Community is at the core of blockchain. This is a tweet from uh, Naval Ravikant, who's the founder of AngelList and highly involved in the blockchain space. And he said, there's only two, two skill sets that matter for blockchain entrepreneurs in this order, technology development and community development. That's it. And we've seen it. We, we've had a chance to advise and, and consult for a bunch of uh, crypto companies through CMX. And, and community is such a core part. They're so invested in organizing people because the only way the technology works is if you get people to be bought into it and contributing to it, uh, building on the platform. It's essentially open source on steroids. And it's actually tied to the valuations that you're seeing in tokens. So this was another uh, study done where they tried to figure out what are the variables that impact the, uh, the price of, of tokens and, and how it grows. And community was the number one factor they found that influenced the price of tokens on, on these uh, blockchain servers. And so what we're seeing is blockchain is getting very interested in community management. If you type in crypto community management into Google, you will see a spread of services and platforms and new technologies that are being built, all focused on community management. They'll mostly be names and companies and people you've never heard of, because if you look at them, most of them weren't doing community management until a year ago. <laughs> but they are very invested in it. They're learning quick. And it's been interesting to see there's new tools, new platforms. Uh, they're very data driven. And, and it's bringing a lot of innovation to our space, which I think is exciting. It's a good thing. There's a lot of energy that's going to be brought and continue to be brought to, uh, to the community management space because of the interest and the energy around blockchain. And it, it's, a, it's a little bit different from uh, other community management uh, projects. Uh, from the get-go, from like day one, they are global communities. There are people all over the world. It's really big in Russia. It's really big in Asia. It, it's spreading very, very fast. So from a community management perspective, they have to be able to manage multiple time zones, and they have to uh, 
be a global community, which also means they have to have 24-7 around-the-clock community management, right? Moderation, they need to always have people on. So they're hiring a lot. They're hiring really fast. They're building community teams really quickly. They all have basically the same member distribution of investors, uh, developers, and users. So investors are the people buying the tokens. The developers are the people building on the platform. Users are who will ultimately actually use the products, assuming they work. There's FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt is a, a term commonly used in, in crypto community management of people who come and you know, spread doubt and spread fear about a, a token or about something not working. And it's a, a huge issue that they all deal with. And it, it, all of them will have some sort of technical uh, knowledge requirements. They're all looking for technical community managers, someone who can speak the language of developers and understand those problems. And there are some interesting projects as well that might impact uh, the community management space if, if they actually do work and take off. So there are uh, platforms like Authentic, which is trying to fight the troll problem online. Uh, by using the blockchain to make sure you're using a real identity and prevent fake accounts and fake usernames from being created. Uh, they're trying to end, essentially, online trolling and a lot of the harassment issues. Uh, there are platforms that are just actually being built on the blockchain to replace a lot of the bigger social networks and community platforms, uh, like uh, Mastodon, which basically is decentralizing where your social data is stored. So instead of Facebook or LinkedIn owning that data on their servers, you would own it and it would live on the blockchain. User-generated content is being built on the blockchain. So if people are contributing articles, uh, it's a the, it could be the future of something like Huffington Post, where the people contributing are, are being properly rewarded and incentivized, and it's completely transparent who's, who's contributing and how. And then for referral-based programs as well, for ambassador programs, there are platforms like Referium, uh, which will perfectly track how people are referring new people to your products, to your services, and uh, make it measurable so you can properly reward uh, your advocates and the people driving referrals for you. So this is a, uh, it's a space that I think it's, it's just really interesting, right? Like, it's, it's growing, and it's so invested in community. When we, when we talk to blockchain community, uh, blockchain companies, they never ask about the value of community. That's not even a question that comes up. They're literally just like, how do we do this? How do we do it right? And how do we do it really fast? So they're going to be hiring a lot of community professionals. We've already seen them hire a lot of community professionals. They're going to be growing, um, but uh, quality is going to be an issue because they don't necessarily understand what it truly means to build community. Uh, some of them are just, you know, there's a, a Telegram group with tens of thousands of people, but it's very shallow engagement and there's no real sense of community. So making sure that if you are exploring roles or you are getting involved in a blockchain space that it's quality, the products are quality, and the communities are quality will be really important. And finally, we have trend number five. So despite all this energy, despite a greater need for community than ever before and greater connection, unfortunately, we've heard this uh, brought up a few times already yesterday, community is still struggling to get buy-in. Now, when we did a study last year, we asked community professionals how confident are they in their, in their metrics. They're, we're getting better. You know, we're getting more confident. You could see uh, a lot of people, the most people rated it three out of four, but the least amount of people rated it four out of four. Right? So we're starting to get more confident, but we're still not fully leaned in. We're still not really understanding how do we get the right metrics in place and how do we measure our communities. Uh, it's a little bit better, uh, it turns out, for larger companies. We saw there was a correlation of if you're at a larger company, the likelihood that you're confident in your metrics uh, does go up. Um, maybe you have more resources. Maybe your organization already has more structure that your community is plugged into. Um, but especially for smaller companies, it's been really hard to, to prove those metrics. And in a recent study by the Community Roundtable, they found out that 45% of the community managers who responded to their survey reported feeling burned out in the last 12 months. So community professionals are still getting burned out, still spread thin, still unable to prove that value and get those resources. And if you compare our study last year and their study this year, the number one reason we found that community programs failed, not enough resources. The number one reason that they found that community managers are burning out, not enough resources. 
So this is an ongoing challenge, and we had some amazing talks from Rich and Sarah yesterday talking about how to really hone in on the value that you're creating in your community. Hone in on not just any engagement, but making sure you're having impact for your organization. It's the only way we're gonna get buy-in, not burn out, be able to do all the things for our communities that we wanna do, is if we can really hone in on that and feel confident in our metrics and be able to get that buy-in and the resources we need. But we're still spending most of our time on engagement. This is also from the Community Roundtable's report. Uh, they found that community managers were only spending about 10% of their time on, on the business side of things, on business management. Most of the time, the extreme amount of our time is going to engagement, it's going to content, it's going to strategy, and managing the technical platforms, right? So it's, it's, you know, it's the whirlwind of the day-to-day -day work that we have to do, and we can't just let it go. Uh, it makes it hard to step back and think about how do we actually align our community with our business. So we have to prioritize that. So to summarize, privacy and data ownership are becoming a huge priority. So as you're building your communities, as you are uh, organizing your data and making sure you're GDR, GDPR compliant, just get out ahead of it, right? Like make this a, a competitive advantage. Make it so that your community does respect your, your users' privacy, does respect their data, and make sure that they feel comfortable with how they're participating in your online community. Make sure you're using platforms that make them feel comfortable. Groups and messaging are going to continue to grow. They are on the rise. So uh, whether you are building your own platform um, and you're using th that kind of software or, or maybe you have an opportunity to create more chat-based experiences or more group-based experiences for your community members, recognize that this is how people are starting to use and inter uh, use the internet, interact on the internet more and more. People are pushing back on the growth at all costs mentality. So uh, I think we're going to continue to see that pushback on, on not just fast growth, not growth at all costs, but more intentional, more focused uh, businesses and online platforms. Blockchain and the decentralized web could be the future, and it's really captured the imagination of the tech industry. And so it's definitely something I think uh, community professionals should be paying attention to. And community builders are still figuring out how to succeed in the world of business. But we're seeing big improvements. I think like just seeing the conversations that were had here, seeing the, the speakers and what they were able to share on the stage yesterday. Uh, I've been in this industry for a long time. I think we are making big strides. We are getting smarter. I'm seeing more people get into more senior roles and, and understand how to communicate their value. So we will improve and we will get there. So just a few predictions for the next year to wrap up. One, I think the social media backlash will continue at a rapid pace. I think people are going to continue to push back on these large platforms. They're exhausted. They're tired of, of not having a positive experience on the, online, and they're going to be looking for more positive experiences or turning back to that offline experience and starting to look more on how do they create a more quality community experience for themselves. So we're going to see people st continue to push back on using these big platforms, and, and they're going to be seeking new, new spaces and new platforms. Two, I think there will be a noticeable shift away from that VC funding as the only option. I think we're going to see a lot more stories shared in publications about companies that decided not to take VC funding and decided to grow slowly. I think we're going to see a lot more funding options like NDVC start to come up that will change the motivations, the incentives for companies. Three, I think community platforms are going to start to become a lot more specific and focused on objectives. I think like the days of really, really big, really, really expensive platforms that try to do everything for everybody are going to be behind us. I think uh, we're looking for, like Rich said, you know, what, what, how do you drive real value with your, with your communities? How do you have impact? And so how will technology help you track that? How will our tools help us focus our communities on achieving specific objectives rather than just general engagement that tries to do everything? Four, I think crypto will be a major uh, player in the community space. Uh, but like I said, I think quality will be an issue. So I think you're going to see a lot of people in this room end up taking jobs in crypto because they're paying well, they're bought into community, they're moving really fast. But we just need to be thoughtful and intentional about how we're doing work there and, and the kind of roles that we take on there. 
And finally, I think community professionals will make big improvements in getting buy-in in 2019. I think we're ready for it. What do you all think? Yeah? And of course, my final prediction. Thank you so much. Those are the five trends for the industry. We have lots more coming. Let's have another good day, too. <laughs>